Hello, and welcome back to the madness. Okay, guys, I have tried to start this video four times already. <sighs> Warning, um, this isn't a happy video. Um, I'll get right to the point. On Wednesday, my mother passed away. So, the last time I talked to you guys was, I want to say, Sunday. I did a stitch with me, right? So, Monday, um, went to work, and about 10 o'clock, I got a phone call from the nursing home that mom is in, and they were like, we are just updating you on her wound, and I'm like, hold up, take a step back, what are you talking about, no one's told me about a wound, and they're like, oh, they should have. Um, your mother has, uh, of course, now my brain's not going to work. Um, basically, I forgot. See, if Becca was here, she would tell me what it was called. Compression wound? Yes, I think that's what they call it. A compression wound. Which I knew what that meant. I said, okay, where is it? Basically, it's a bed sore. Um, I said, okay, where is it? And there, they're like, it's on her butt cheek. I was like, okay. And they're trying to go into, you know, telling me. I said, I, I said, no, stop right there. I said, I know all about compression wounds. I said, um, this was one of the main things that killed my father. Same place. So, um, of course, they tried blaming it on the hospital from the week before because, or it was two weeks before, um, I remember telling you guys in the vlog that mom had called me and there was something wrong with her bone marrow and not keeping plasma, I think it was, in her blood or something. I don't remember now. Um, but <clears throat> here's something that you need to understand is no one... The nursing home never called me to tell me they were taking her to the hospital. The hospital never called me to get permission to work on her. And the next thing I know, my mom calls me and tells me she's in the hospital and she's been here for three days. And um, that she's going home in a couple of days. So... I was like, okay. So the nursing home trying to call, trying to blame it on the hospital when she was in the hospital at that time. So I was like, okay, I'm not worried because mom has had compression wounds before. So this isn't something new. Um, she usually gets them on her legs though because of, um, I don't know. I think it's, she always said it was because of, she had lymphedema and she would retain water and, oh my gosh, her legs would like swell up with water and then she would get compression wounds and the doctors always, you know, took care of them. She had to do that, um, I think it's called a Uber boot or something like, oh, um, on the boot, uniboot. I think it's uniboot. So that's it. I think that's what it's called. But anyways, I'm used to her getting them. So, but on the butt cheek, it kind of, you know, that that's, that's a little different. When it's on the butt cheek or on the back, that's usually neglect, you know? Um, so, anyways, here comes Tuesday morning. And I get a phone call at 8.10. From the nursing home um telling me that they are rushing my mother to the hospital she's not eating she's not drinking they don't tell me how long she hasn't been eating or drinking and her um blood pressure is very very low it's like okay now, the blood pressure thing, we've dealt with the blood pressure thing before because her blood pressure does go very low. Um, 
the one time I rushed her to the hospital, she was arguing with me. She didn't, she wasn't going to the hospital. She wasn't going to the hospital. And I'm like, there is something wrong. You're going to the hospital. So, um, that day I actually called the paramedics. The paramedics put her in my car and then I took her to the hospital because I can't lift her on my own. Um, so, which I didn't know that they, that was an option that they would help you put them in your own car. But anyways, not going into that whole thing. But, um, so, and when we got to the hospital that, that time, um, they took her blood pressure and they're like, it's barely reading. And I'm like, okay. And it was like, they took her blood pressure. They told me, you know, it was dangerous slow. It was hard to get it. And the next thing I know, there was six people in there working on her. And I was like, holy crap, you know? So we've dealt with low blood pressure before. So I wasn't worried. Then, oh, this is going to be a bad one. This one. Oh, no, it came right out. Okay. Um. Yeah, I hate snags. Or not snags, not. Anyway, so, um, yeah, and I apologize if this goes long or if this is too short. I'm just going to basically tell you what's happened this week and then, yeah. Anyways, um, so it was about 30 minutes later, I get a phone call from the hospital asking permission to work on my mom. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Now, why this is so alarming is because they never call to get permission to treat my mom. Um, this was the first time ever, which right away was red flags for me. I was like, she has to be unconscious. If they're calling to get permission, they can't get permission from her. So she has to be unconscious. So, um, I'm a little freaked out, but I still go to work. And, um, it was about 45 minutes later, I have a surgeon calling me saying that, um, That <clears throat> she came in with low blood pressure, not eating, not drinking. Sorry, I know that my big old hand is right there. Um, not eating, not drinking. And then they started running some tests. Now, this is the part that really, like, worries me. They find out that her lung is, okay, what do they call it? It's not deflated. Anyways, they had to put a test, a, uh, a chest tube in because her lung was, God, why are these, okay, these terms aren't going to come to me, are they? Anyways, it was deflated. I can't think of the real word, what they use. So they had to do a, a tube in her lung, put a tube in her lung. Which, I don't know if you've ever seen that happen. That is is very painful. And um, usually it has to stay in. And for a while, I mean, it happened to my dad. Um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a pretty thing at all. So anyways... Um, once they did that, then they took her to do scans and they found out that her abdomen, I can never say the word, her stomach was, um, oh God, my brain extended, meaning it was filling up with fluid. They didn't know why, um, that there was a hole in her colon that 
She was malnourished. Um, God, I know there was a couple other things. And they'll probably come to me later on as I'm talking, but they might not. It was a long list. And he's like, I need permission to take her to surgery. I'm like, yes. And he's like, well, hold on. He goes, I want to tell you right now, I'm a straight sh shooter. I don't sugar cute coat things. Okay. Words are not going to be my friends today. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but I'm very blunt. I said, that's how I like it. Tell me. And he's like, um, I cannot guarantee that she will come off the table. She has a 50, 50 shot coming off the table. And if she does make it off the table, I don't know what kind of life she will have. Do you know what your mother's wishes? And after they would tell me everything, um, like, okay. So they would ask me, what, what is your mother's wishes? And I'm like, my mother's wishes is that she doesn't want to be living on a vest. Oh my God. A ventilator. We understand that you have to be put on a ventilator sometimes for your body to heal. Because my dad lived on a ventilator for six months. And I am so thankful because we struggled with that with him because we knew no ventilator. And the hospital didn't know his wishes, even though there was an advanced directory with him and everything. They swore they didn't have a copy, but we were very thankful that they didn't have the copy because we realized that being put on a ventilator does not mean that you're going to stay on it forever. In his case, it did, but that's because he had so many things wrong with him. But anyways, um, so I said, the only thing is, is she doesn't want to be a vegetable living on a ventilator, having no life. And he's like, okay. And so they told me that they were going to go in and they were going to disconnect the bowel, put a bag. Um, oh God, there were so many things that they were doing. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go into it, but every single time he said, so would your mom want this? And I'm like, I wasn't like understanding. I'm like, okay, how do I say this? Every time I was like stressing, but if she has no life, then we, we shouldn't do this, you know? And I was just getting so confused. And finally I'm like, okay, listen, this is your mother laying there. What would you do? You know, her wishes. What would you do? And he's like, I would do the surgery. Oh, okay. So, yeah, see, I'm I'm sorry, guys. I'm leaving things out. I said, okay, what if we don't do the surgery? What happens? And he blunt, I mean, right away, um, she will be dead within 24 to 72 hours. I'm like, okay. I said, that's why I was like, if it was your mother, what would you do? Because at this point, I'm thinking... He's basically telling me she's not going to make it off the table. He really thought he was, she was not making it off the table. And I'm like, is it torture to make, to do the surgery? That's why I asked, what would you do if it was your mother? And he said, I would give her the fighting chance. And he goes, it looks like your mother is a fighter. And I'm like, oh yes, yeah, she's a fighter. Um, she has gone through a lot in her life. She has gone through a lot of health issues and she's always fought her way back and he's like that's what I would do I would give her the chance to fight I was like okay so did the surgery um <laughs> told me it was going to take anywhere from two to three hours and um Oh, yeah. He also told me that what's more than likely what's going to happen is they were going to go in and do the work today and then leave her. Basically, her stomach opened, you know, put a whole bunch of bandages. So it's not like it's just opened 
and um, then they would have to go back in tomorrow and um, reassess what's happening and um, do other things. And I was told um, she might never, she might have to live with the colossopy bag. I'm not saying it right, but you, I hope you guys know what that is. Um, you know, all these things. So I was like, okay. So um, the surgeon says, okay, well, we'll be taking her in to surgery here in a few minutes. I'm like, okay. So I'm all upset. So, and I'm at work in my car. I just, and here's another thing too. I went in early to do my paperwork and I did my paperwork and I was going to go do John's paperwork. And then I realized that I didn't have his, um, trip sheets for the last day that he worked the last trip sheet and I need that to actually do his paperwork and, you know for he can get paid so my gut just said oh just don't don't do it you can do it tomorrow and go trip go put all the addresses in your GPS basically so right when I got out to my car the phone rang and it was the surgeon so that that was kind of like weird you know when you when you step back from the situation, it's like, do, 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 you know, because I don't bring my phone into the shop. I guess I should say that too. So, and I had already missed his phone call a minute before. I mean, two minutes before, but anyways, um, so what does it matter? One minute, two minutes. It does not really matter. Does it? Um, so I hang up with the surgeon and Sheridan taps on my window and she looks at me and she I open the door and she's like what is going on and I'm like I mean I'm in tears you know and she's like John is blowing up the phone in the the shop I was in the bathroom I come out I told him I come get you and I find you like this. What is going on? And I explained to her what happened. Um, she's like, she said, well, we'll talk to John. And I'm like, where is he? <laughs> you know, because we have three phones and she's like, oh, he's right there on the counter. <laughs> so I pick up the phone and John's like, Hey, have you been trying to call me? And I'm like, uh, no. And he hears my voice and, Mind you, there's already 33 deliveries, and he's like, I'm on my way. I'm like, okay. So, <laughs> okay, it's funny now. It is hilarious to me now. So, um, what does my husband do? He tells my, he, he has no information either. All he knows is that the surgeon had just called me and they're rushing mom into surgery and she has a 50% chance that she's even going to make it from the surgery. He has no information. That's all he has. Cause he's like, okay, I'm coming to work. Bye. You know? So what does he do? He decides to tell my daughter and my son that Nana's probably going to die today. That's the information he gives them. Nana's probably going to die today. And um, the way I find this out is um, gosh, I'm trying not to get my big old hand in there. Um, So I load my packages. I get off the phone with John. I load my packages and um, I pull to the back of the um, parking lot to put the addresses in my GPS because I just realized, yeah, that's what I came out to do. But then the surgeon called me and I never got to do it. I didn't put one address in. So... 
Um, all of a sudden, Jonathan calls my phone. And I answer and he goes, what the hell is going on? And I'm like, um, well, first of all, how the hell do you know anything? He's like, dad called me. And I'm like, where are you? He's like, I'm at work. I'm like, okay. I said, well, get somewhere quiet. <sighs> what in the world? Fuzz. Get out. Um, I explained everything to him. And, oh my God, it, it, it's heartbreaking because Jonathan and my mom used to be best friend. I mean, Jonathan, N Nana was Jonathan's person to go to. He loved his papa, but he loved his Nana. Now, Becca loved her papa and didn't really care for her Nana. Um, I remember when Becca was like a year and a half and my dad had to go to bed. It was like the first time that Becca was spending the night at Nana's house. Maybe she was like a year. I don't I think she was like a year. Now see, here's another thing. Jonathan spent the night at Nana's house, I think when he was a month old. Becca didn't do it until she was almost a year or older than a year. Because Becca wanted her mama and daddy. That's all she wanted. She loved her papa, but she wanted her mama and daddy. So um, I remember the first time she spent the night at my mom's and dad's. My mom called me and she's like, Becky, I'm sorry, but you, you got to come get her. And I'm like, what's going on? She goes, your, your father went to bed and this child won't stop crying. She wants her papa. She wants nothing to do with me. So we had to go pick her up. And, um, Jonathan actually got on the phone. She goes, Ma, he goes, Mama, I'm trying everything. Becca just won't stop crying. I even made the silly faces that she loves. She won't stop crying. <laughs> she was a Papa's girl. Oh my gosh. So, anyways, um, my son and mom has had this amazing bond until um he was a high he was he was actually living with my mom and my mom got addicted to um narcotics and their relationship cuz my okay my son is he's actually walked away from friends he is anti-drugs all the way um i remember the one time he came home and he was so mad i'm like what's up with you and he's like well that friendship is over i'm like what are you talking about he goes i went to my friend's house i'm not gonna say names and um they were smoking weed and I told them, can you please not do it around me? Can you wait till I leave? And they were like, why don't you just join us? You know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, seriously, if I'm here, you can't do it in front of me. And they were like, well, then I guess you should just leave. And I was like, okay, bye. So when his Nana started doing them, um... He didn't, he didn't care for it at all. And they would fight about it. And, you know, a drug addict. Okay, hold on. I gotta, I gotta do the word. I was all twisty. Um, yeah, I'm in my nightgown. You like my nightgown? <laughs> That's a whole story. I was supposed to, it's been so crazy at work the last couple of weeks. Um, every day, 30 
or more deliveries. Now, I can handle 20 on my own. And you're like, well, it's only 10 more deliveries. Why can't you handle just 10 more deliveries? I'd be able to handle 10 more deliveries if when I walked in the door, my stuff was done. But when your orders aren't getting done until the end of the day and you're not getting home until five, six, seven o'clock at night. Sorry, I just shook you guys big time. Um, it becomes a problem. And it's very frustrating. Okay. Why are you keep snagging on me? Or nodding, it's the better word. Um, so anyways, um at one point I don't know why I just went on to the whole Okay, this is ridiculous. Let's pull it through, and I think what I need to do is, let's cut that, and let's give it a little magic. Okay, now let's see. Work it, work it, okay. Um, anyways, um... It got so bad with mom and her pills that we would have to, um, I'd have to keep the pills at my house and I would make up baggies and then give them to Jonathan and Jonathan would give her a bag a day and then she would take her pills. Well, my mom started accusing Jonathan of stealing his pills her pills that's why we went to doing that because she had control of all the pills and then she would take let's i think it was she was allowed six narco a day and she was taking 12 to 15 and then blaming Jonathan that he was stealing the drugs. So then the drugs came to my house and then I would start doing that and Jonathan would give a, a bag a day and then she was accusing him of taking them out of her bag and it was like, this is ridiculous. So we, we moved Jonathan back home. It was like, no. And that had changed their relationship. Jonathan wanted nothing to do with her because Jonathan's so anti-drugs and to be accused of that, that was like stepping over a line that, yeah, you don't do. So anyways, um, you know, I told him and he started bawling on the phone and thank God Morgan came and picked him up from work. I went and I picked up Becca. Or no, I I think I called Becca. Or while I was, I see, I don't remember exactly what happened. I think while I was on the phone with Jonathan, Becca called me and said, hey, do you want me by your side today? And... She said that she had contacted her professors, which, okay, this is like so strange that this is all happening. It happened this week because this week was supposed to be Becca's winter break. But because they started um, the semester, okay, it's shaking you again, um, so late, they were supposed to start on the 3rd of January. I think it was the 3rd. You know, the first week of January, they didn't start until January 23rd. So because they did that, they took their winter break. Basically, they get a week off. Well, because they started late and I think they took the spring break away from them, too. I think they get only like one day or two days instead of the week. This is really starting to peeve me off. I'm not getting any progress done. Um, so 
what they did instead of calling it winter break or whatever she got and see it always happens around this time because her birthday was last week and two times it's actually fallen on her birthday week so she's been home for her birthday anyways um she got Wednesday and Thursday as they were calling mental health days so she had no school so this is Tuesday so she was just missing Tuesday classes and um, I asked her I said well did you get what did your professor say and what did you say to your professors and she said that she contacted her professors and said that because she didn't get any information from me yet. That's why I was asking her. That my grandmother was um, on her deathbed. And that I needed to be with you today. And I apologize. But I don't apologize. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> She's hilarious. I love her so much. So I come and pick her up. Because she's like, um, can you just give me. Um, time to jump in the shower. And I'm like, yeah. So I went and um, did a couple of deliveries, like made my way to my house because my house is in my delivery section area. And I came and picked her up and I told her everything that was going on. And um, so now, mind you, this was we're at about now in the timeline mom has been in surgery for what i thought was 45 minutes right the phone rings st john's macomb and i'm like oh god becca here we go here we go here it is and i get on the phone and this guy real casual hi this is blah 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 from McCombs. i'm like yes yes you know i'm like just shut up and just tell me he's like um he's the ear nose and mouth specialist and i was like what <laughs> i'm like are you calling to tell me she's dead and he's like what? No, no. She actually just passed me on the stretcher on the way to surgery. I'm like, they told me they were rushing her in like 45 minutes ago. And then it was going to be like in two to three hours. And the I even asked the doctor, I said, if she dies on the, the table, will you please call me and let me know? You know, I don't want to be worrying about this. You know what I mean? I want information as soon as you get it i want the information and don't hold back basically so i thought that's what it was it's only it hasn't even been an hour so they're calling me to tell me she's dead right and he was like so funny no she just passed me on the gurney we're literally rolling her into surgery right now i just need your permission to be able to, i'm like yes you have my permission you have my permission so um yeah, that was crazy. So I get done with work because John helped me. Oh my God, he has been a rock. Um, I was able to um, be home. I think me and Becca got home at like 4.30. And John had been home for an hour. So we worked it out where John was probably delivering for three hours i said just think if he didn't help me i would be out there until 7 30 8 o'clock you know so anyways um speaking of rocks i've had rebecca tiny puffer fish by my side every single minute of the day i had miss coffee by my side i'd pick up the phone and message her now i know you've heard us talk about how we joke about um i could message her and like 30 minutes later she'll get back to me do i get mad no we both have busy lives she's messaged me it's been an hour sometimes because i'm at work or you know i don't have my phone right next to me 
let me tell you, she is a true, true, true friend. Never went more than, I, I don't even say a, a full minute would go by. I would message and she would be right there. Um, oh, I don't want to cry. I really don't want to cry. Um, we only talk through messenger. Um, we do little clips to each other. We usually speak. I mean, we text sometimes, but we usually do the speaking through Instagram messenger. So when this was happening, um, mm, I'm going to cry. No, I can feel it. Sorry, guys. Um, she's, she gives me this message and she's like, listen, do you want me, do you want, do you want to call me? She goes, I don't care if we're just sitting on the phone, listening to each other breathe. It's better than, you know, one little one minute clips back and forth. That meant a lot to me. That meant so much to me. So I was like, sure, here's my phone number. And we chatted. <laughs> of course, me and her never had dead silence. <laughs> but it was just, I don't know. It was, it was amazing. She has been amazing. Um, yeah, if I didn't have Miss Coffee, Rebecca and John. Oh, and Sandy. Um, I don't think I could have done this by myself like I had to. Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, so. Um, it's 4.35 o'clock. So, mom, okay, so, 11, so, 12, 1, 2, she should have been out of surgery 2, 2, 30, from what the, the surgeon was telling me. It's 4, 30, and, um, the surgeon called me from his cell phone, and he told me, you have any questions, you want any updates, you just call this number. Someone will answer it and they will let you know what's going on. And I was like, oh God, okay, I, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna break down and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this number. He said I could use it, I'm gonna use it. He goes, wow, you're good. And I'm like, what? He goes, I was just picking up my cell phone to call you. Um, I just left her in post-op. Um, he's like, I can't believe how well she did. She did amazing. We did have to leave her stomach open. He used the technical terms. I'm not going to because I can't say that one damn word. Um, and how they were going to go back in the morning. Um, the main reason that they leave it open too, because if there's like green, yellow, brown, yucky stuff in the adamant, I can't say it, stomach, um, it's just easy to take care of it right away. Um, oh, and that, uh, what was the problem was there was a hole in her lower bowel and there was a whole bunch of other problems that they fixed. I don't remember everything now. I can't. Um, so he's, he's like, asked him, uh, I, optimistic um can't believe how well she did and um that he was confident that they were going in the next morning and doing more stuff so um is that the first time I Oh, wow. I don't even know. I feel like that's the first time I... I've only done one strand yet so far. That's crazy. Um, 
I'm stitching slow today. If that's all I've done was one strand. So, um, sorry, my big old hand. Um, I don't know how I can do this where it's not my big old hand that you're seeing. We are going to magic this one up a lot. There we go. Um, big old hand. So, anyways, the next morning, I get... Okay, no, they did call me that night to update me that she was doing really good. Um... Yeah, everything was looking good. So then the next morning I get a phone call and she took a turn for the worst. And um, that she was already on two what they call pressers because her blood pressure was so low and that they were adding a third press presser and she, she was not going into surgery today and um, we'll take it from there. I was like, okay. So get off the phone with her. I mean, there was a lot more to that whole thing. But, you know, I don't remember exactly what was said. So, it was about 15 minutes later, she calls me back. Same nurse, too. Her name is Jessie. And she's like, okay, so here's the thing. We need permission. We are going to do... Um, so, what she was telling me is that on the second phone call that her body was filling up with acid and that they needed to do dialysis, but it's not the real dialysis. It was called C R something, but it's like dialysis. It's got the same tubes and stuff like that. But this was to get out the acid, which I didn't understand any of this. But I was like, yeah, do whatever you need to do to keep her alive, you know. So, um, she's like, is any family member coming up today? Oh, this was the first time she asked me, the first phone call, is any family member coming up today? And I was like, no, um, because... Going to the hospital really was freaking me out about COVID. I I have health issues. My husband has diabetes as I have asthma. Um, my husband has diabetes, asthma, um, high blood pressure. He's got a long list of crap that's wrong with him. So I was very scared to go to the hospital. So the second time when she called, she says, um are you still planning on not coming up here? She goes, because if you plan on seeing your mom again, I suggest you get up here soon. Basically, she's telling me, um, well, she, she actually, she literally said, I, when I said, okay, I, I'm on my way, I'm gonna jump in the shower and I'm on my way. She goes, hurry. I don't know how much longer we can make her last. I was like, whoa, you know, this is serious. Which I already knew it was serious. Don't think I didn't think it was serious. But that was the phone call. If you want to see your mother again, get your butt up here, you know. So, which I remember getting that phone call with my dad. Now, mind you, with my dad, I was up there every single day. Okay, that was weird. That was the front door noise. Um, so, you know. <sighs> and then once I got up there, I basically told my dad that it's okay. I, 
I would take care of mom. And within 15 minutes, he passed away because he just needed his, he just needed us there so he could and to give him permission to do it is how I feel in my book. What happened? I told him to go walk with Jesus and he did. So I get in the room and, um, well, first I just to, I'm not even going to go into that. It was just, it was very hard to get into her room. <sighs> so once I finally get into her room, there were people, you know, there was nurses and doctors standing outside the hallway, um, blocking her door. And by now I'm a basket case from what I had to go through in the freaking lobby. And then you get up to ICU and okay, I, I'll just get into it. Um, I get up there and there's this phone that you have to pick up, which I've done this before. I've done this multiple times with my father, so I understand it. But there's a lady on the phone and it just keeps ringing and ringing and ringing. Instead of hanging up, which any normal person would do is you hang up the phone and then you pick it up again. Because who knows? Maybe it's not ringing on the other side, you know? But um, this cleaning lady comes by and she's like, oh, honey, just just hang up the phone and come with me. I, I'm devastated. I am crying. I'm like, I don't know what to do, where to go. You know, this is all new to me. I haven't been to this hospital, the ICU. And so now I just want to kick myself. So I say to the lady, can I come too? And this bitch, and she was a bitch. She turns around, she goes, I don't know you. You need to just pick up that phone. And then she puts her arm around the other lady. And she goes, come on, Miss Williams. I'll take you to your mother. And I'm like, you fucking bitch. My mother is dying, you know. Which I understand she didn't know me. But how she she did the situation, it was like, I don't know. I, I, yeah. So anyways, when I get to the door after dealing with, you know, that staff member, even though she was a cleaning lady, I got to the door, see all the doctors and I say, can I go in? You know, cause I I'm devastated here. My brain wasn't working. And the one nurse turns around and she goes, are you the daughter Becky? And I'm like, yes. And she goes, I'm Jesse. I'm like, I talked to you on the phone. She's like, yes. I'm the one who called you the two times. So once I got in the room, it was, it was fine. Um, well, it wasn't fine, but next thing I know, there's, there's two nurses explaining things to me. And then I don't know. I just felt like I needed to be out of the way. So whenever a nurse would come in, it was weird how this room was set up. There was like this little like nook, I want to call it. Basically, it was just this corner and I was just in this little corner. And the next thing I remember is that I, I know I was in shock. Once I saw her, which I was already prepared, they already told me the pressures that they were giving her was taking the blood from her fingertips and her toes and giving it to the major organs. So I already knew that her toes and her hands would be blue. I was ready for that. Saw that with my father. A lot of this stuff was not new to me because I had gone with, gone through it with my father. So I understood it. But... The next time I know, thing I know, now mind you, this is only in like a 10 minute time span that this is all happening. I have four nurses around me and two doctors and I'm in this little corner. So, you know, it's like I have a wall of medical staff and I remember, I, I think I was actually leaning on the wall in the corner and I got two masks on because that hospital, you have to have two masks on. I couldn't breathe. And I could feel, my, feel myself like hyperventilating. 
And I got the doctor in my right ear telling me um, that they were going to try this dialysis. But, okay, I can't get through the hole. There we go. Um, but they're, they're worried about right when they put the tube in her neck that she will code. Oh, yeah. And here's another thing, too. I made the decision at home um, the first time that the first phone call, because she was doing so bad, Every time they talked to you, they were they would ask you, um, has your, I feel like that's not sitting right. Um, oh shoot, my, my scissors just went flying. Um, do you still want, do you want a DNR put in place? Um, so I learned a lot. It's, you don't just have to say do not resuscitate. You could tell them what they can do. So I gave permission to electric shock and she was already vented. So that part was already taken care of. You know, the only thing is I told them I don't want any compressions to happen because, um, I learned out from Linda dying how, um, aggressive that is. And, I'm not going to go into it, but I just, that was something, the state that she was in Wednesday, I didn't want any compressions. The state she was in Tuesday, yes, I wanted full CPR on her. So anyways, um, the doctor was asking me, you know, we understand no compressions, but we can do the electric shock. And, um, I think they called it something else. I call it electric shock. You know, when they put those paddles on you, the defibrillator, um, so he, he's saying all these things to me and he says, she's going into septic shock and her organs are failing. And I... Right then I, I said, stop, 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 because there's everyone moving around. As he's talking to me, I can hear nurses saying, we got to make sure that we have tons of epi on board. But, you know, in their in their terms, um, make sure the crash carts in here. You know, they were getting all this stuff ready. And finally, I just said, nope, stop, 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 stop. And the doctor, he like puts his hand up and everyone just stopped. It was so strange. It was so strange. I didn't think that they were just going to stop, you know, it was just weird. So, um, I said, listen, um, I don't want, I don't want the, I don't want anything. Um, he's like, okay, so explain, what do you mean you don't want anything? I said, no dialysis. He said, okay. So that team walked away. Right when I said no dialysis, three people just bam, gone. And I said, um, you can leave the vent going. If she codes, I don't want anything happen. I don't want epi. I don't want the shocking. I don't want anything. Um, I feel it's her time. Um, I looked at him. I said, you said two things to me. You said septic shock and you said organs failing. That's my Okay, how do I say this? And I forgot how I even said it to him. But I said, basically I said, when I hear those two things, I know it's time to just let her go in peace. And, oh my God, the staff was so amazing. They're like, yes, 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 yes. I said, this isn't my first rodeo. I've done this with my dad. So you said the two code words to me. Those two code words mean stop. And so, basically... Um, they make me sit down. They tell me I can take off my mask. Um, by then I was basically hyperventilating and just like, I felt like I was going to pass out and, oh my God, this one nurse, 
he was amazing. Um, he, cause I couldn't have anyone up there. Only one person could be up there. So I didn't have Becca. She would have been my person to be up there with me. And that guy started to rub my back. A simple gesture. Up at my shoulder. He would squeeze my shoulder and then he would rub. Squeeze my shoulder, rub. And I told him once it was just me and him. I'm like, you know what? Oh, I'm going to start crying. I told him, I said, you don't know what a difference that made. And he said, I can tell you right now what a difference it made. I felt you relax. I'm like, yeah, right when you started rubbing my back, it was just like, I felt like everything was okay. And I was telling him, I said, Whew. I'm the only one making these decisions. You don't know if you're making the right decisions. And I said, right when I heard those two words, I just felt like I had to give her some, I don't even know if these are the right words, but humanity. I wanted her, I, no, that's not the right words. I didn't think it was humane to go any further because I felt like her body was telling me it was time. So, whew, okay. So, oh no, I'm wrong. No, wait, no, no, no. At one point, I told him um, to stop the dialysis. That that wasn't going to happen. And I told him no more electric shock. And then um, when I was there, when they finally got me sitting down, um, the doctor kept talking to me. And... Uh, Okay, I got to I got to pause for a second, guys. I got to compose myself. Okay. So, I had to blow my nose and take a couple of hits off of my vape. If you want to know exactly what I did. So, um at one point and I I think that's when he started rubbing my back as I told him, "Listen, you know what? Take her off the vent. Stop the compressor." compressions the not compressions stop the pressers I said it, she's ready she's telling me she's ready and then when everyone left and I was talking to the nurse and telling them you know thank you so much I said I'm so worried that I'm doing the wrong thing but I feel like this is what she would want and I felt like I was, I was, I was making her die, you know, I wasn't giving her the fighting chance, but then my, my brain kept saying, but she's giving you the, the signs, septic shock, do it, you know? So anyways, um, everyone left me. They moved the chair up to the bed. I was able to sit with mom. And, um, okay. This is a hard one, too. So, you know, the whole time I'm, I'm, I'm talking with Miss Coffee, but we're texting because there's no way that, you know, we're texting at this point. And I get it in my mind, okay, you know what? I'm going to call the kids and I'm going to put them on speakerphone. And I'm going to let him say goodbye. Jonathan, oh my God. Ooh, we're not going to go there. <clears throat> Let's just say that Jonathan told his Nana that... Oh, I can't even say it. He forgave her. Told her how much he loved her. It was very emotional. Hung up with him, got on the phone with Becca. Becca was able to say goodbye. 
got a hold of my brother. Well, I didn't get a hold of my brother. I tried to get a hold of my brother. I told him, listen, I let the kids do this. Um, he doesn't have a phone. So he only has a tablet. And the only way I talk to him is through Messenger. So I said, um, I was doing the voice chat with Messenger, Facebook Messenger, which is crappy. Let me tell you, it's crappy. I love Instagram Messenger. I do not like Facebook Messenger. Um, I told him, if you want to say something, I can play it for her. Well, um, two and a half hours after she passed away, he got back to me. Yeah, so, whatever. Um, so then, um... Now, when my dad died, my friend Sandy, she was, she was my rock. Like, Miss Coffee was my rock for my mom. And, um, God, I hate when that happens. Uh, I called her to let her know, you know, what was happening, and, um, she was amazing and all of a sudden the nurses there was three nurses who rushed in but Jesse um I guess who was her main nurse now that I look back at it she comes in and um she starts doing you know all these little tests and now, while I was on the phone with Sandy, um, now I know I saw my mom take her two last breaths. But I didn't know it at the time. Uh, so she's doing these tests. And she goes, she says to me, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check her ankles and see if I can find a pulse there. And I look at her and go, wait a minute. She's dead? And she's like, yeah. She, I said, oh, wait. You were just doing the eye test. You you saw no movement in her eyes. Because that was spooky to me. Um, when Jessie came in and started doing her test, I didn't get up. Because they had moved the chair where I, I could just sit there and they could work on her, basically, you know? And when they did the eye test, I was thinking, God... It looks like not, she's not there, you know? That's what I was thinking in my head. And then it clicked. I'm like, oh, wait, you just did the, the pupil test to see if she was, you know, alive, basically. And she's like, yeah. And then she did it again. She said, see, there's no movement. I'm like, yeah, when you first did it, I was like, God, it's like she's not even there anymore. She's, she was like, exactly. So she turned off the breathing machine and she goes, see, she's, she's not breathing. And I was like, okay. And then she said, time of death, 1048. And I was like, okay. So then I had to make all the phone calls, you know, which it's just basically John, the kids, my brother and my aunt Ray. So, you know, I make all those phone calls and, oh my gosh, let me tell you a story, um, too. I forgot to tell you this. So Tuesday while she's in surgery, um, I, uh, I called my aunt who lives in Texas. That's my mom's sister. And I was telling her, now this is while me and Becca were still at work, you know, driving. And, um, I don't, my Texas accent does not come out unless sometimes when I'm angry or if I'm talking to my aunt. Which I don't talk to my aunt on the phone. We we um 
basically text through messenger once in a while. Um, but it was hilarious. So I'm talking, you know, with my aunt and all of a sudden I see Becca's head like whip over, you know, looking at me and by now me, my me and my aunt were getting off the phone because my aunt was getting really upset and was crying really hard, you know. So we didn't stay on the phone long. I just basically updated her. She told me how much she loved me and to call her with any updates and, you know, basically that. But we were on the phone for about five minutes. And, you know, Becca whips her head around and I'm saying goodbye, and I'm like, I get off the phone, I'm like, what? She goes, I didn't know who you were. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, you were talking with an accent, with a, a heavy accent. And I'm like, it happens when I get around, or when, well, when I got a, when I was on, um, a few years ago, I was on a cruise, and it just happened that my aunt moved to Mexico and we were, we went to her city in Mexico. So she met me when I got off the cruise ship and I spent the day at her house. It was, it was amazing. But, and that's the, the cruise that I went on with Cynthia and Cynthia was like, I can't believe you get around your aunt and you just talk like this different language. And I'm like, mm, it's, it's Southern. It's, it's Texas. I get this twang. Um, yeah. So <laughs> Becca was just cracking up. She's like, I never heard you talk like that. I said, well, you heard me talk with the, you know, the twang. I said, especially, um, which this was hilarious. I think I told this story before when Jonathan went to Tennessee last year and he's like, mom, it was crazy. I got down there and I started talking with the Southern accent. He goes, I don't know where it came from. I said, I could tell you exactly where it came from. I said, you grew up listening to country music. So, um, and I okay. Sorry, I was trying to get... You couldn't see what I was doing. There was a knot near my needle. I couldn't move the thread. Um, I said, and, you know, I don't now as much as I did, like, 15 years ago, talk you with the accent, you know? And he's like, it was just... It was just funny. Morgan kept going, where did this come from? And he's like, I don't know, but... See, I can't, I can't talk Southern on command, but give me around some Southerns and the Southern accent just comes right out. And apparently that happens with Jonathan too. So I thought that was hilarious. She's like, I didn't know who you were. I had to look over to see if you were still you. <laughs> You're just being hilarious now. But yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so... That's why you didn't get a vlog this week is because it's been a, a hell of a week. So, and here's another thing. Oh my gosh. <sighs> then I had to sit in the room with her for an hour and a half after she passed away just so they could type up this one piece of paper for me to sign and after like a half an hour the nurse came in to see you know how it was doing and this wasn't Jesse this was a, a different nurse this nurse came in every time with Jesse but then would leave right away after she did what she had to do well I guess not every time but she was in the room a lot so it, it wasn't like a nurse that I didn't know oh my god oh yeah and um, I'm like skipping so many things. So one thing I am grateful about is it takes a lot of time for them to do anything in the hospital, right? So 
I don't feel guilty because they never stopped my mother's compressors and they never took her off the ventilator. So I was very grateful for that because I didn't feel like I was the one who killed her, you know. Just being blunt here, guys. Letting you know what my mind, you know, I never keep anything back from you. Oh, no. Did I do this? Did I? Okay. Why isn't this wanting to... It's not letting the thread move on the needle. You know how you move it up? It keeps wanting to snag up there. Um, So I was very grateful that it takes them so long to do something because nothing... I gave orders for went through if that makes any sense except for no uh, dialysis but everything else stayed the same it wasn't because of my choices is what I'm trying to say anyways um so you know I was there for about a half an hour when this nurse comes in I'm like how much longer she goes, to be honest with you, it's probably going to take another hour to get these papers. And I was like, oh, okay. Which I, I wanted to get out of there, but I did have Miss Coffee. Me and Miss Coffee just kept chatting back and forth um, the whole time, basically. Um, I, I am the type of person I rather laugh than cry. So she was helping keeping me entertained and I was entertaining her too. So, and at one point she's like, I don't want to sound morbid. I'm like, oh no, no, no. You don't understand this family. If mom was alive, she'd be laughing right along with us. And she's like, okay, okay, okay. So, um, it was just... At one point, okay, I know. <laughs> okay, I am a humorous person, so you got to understand this. What was cracking us up is at one point, don't know how it happened, there was a freaking fly in the room. I was trying to kill the fly because the fly kept landing on mom. It's like, seriously? And I could see if it, we were in a, a normal room. We're in the ICU. How does a fly get in the ICU? It was just like crazy. Um, That's why I said mom would be laughing too if she was alive. Because she would have thought that was hilarious. And then be like, but this is the ICU. How did a damn fly get in the ICU? <sighs> so, after I got out of there, um, right when I got to the car, I told... I called John yeah I called John and I said okay I'm out um John had already set up an appointment with the funeral home at one o'clock I had to go to the funeral home Becca texted me and she said um where are you uh, she wanted to be right by my side so, John was at the gas station, and then he was going back to the shop. So, I went back to the shop. Um, the, the only thing that made me mad is John still expected me to work. And it was like, seriously? So, me and Becca did a fast run to the funeral home and to a business, and... We ended up being three minutes late to the funeral home, which was no big deal. Me and Becca took care of all the arrangements at the funeral home. And then I was, I called John and I said, listen, I just got to go home. I can't, I can't do anything. Um, it was, it was awful. It, it was awful. And the thing that I kept going through my head is what I couldn't understand is me and my dad were super, super, super close. Me and my mom were close, but then when she became a drug addict, we, um, we lost our bond some, you know, 
Now, mind you, she lived with me. I still took care of her. But me and my mom used to be best friends. But me and my dad had, you know, that daddy-daughter. And what I couldn't understand is why my mom's death was affecting me so much harder than my dad's. Which John finally summed it up for me. Once I, you know, spoke and said... I don't understand why is this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, because with your dad, it took your dad six months to die. You had all that time with him. He said, your mom, it happened too fast. And I said, yeah, I was thinking about that. I said, it was, what, 28? 29 hours from the first phone call until she was passed away it was 28 29 hours that this all happened in we had no time to prepare she was last week she was doing great she was saying you know she had a couple of um bad weeks you know when she was in the hospital but she once she got back, she was feeling good. So we didn't know she was feeling bad because I don't talk to her every single day. But I just talked to her the week before, you know. <coughs> so I couldn't understand it. How in a week, not even a week. Well, no, it was exactly a week. Because she go from feeling fantastic oh great i gotta plug you guys in i didn't realize i didn't have you plugged in um from her feeling fantastic to now she's dead you know oh gosh can i plug you in did i plug you in okay i gotta stop you to make sure that you're okay. plugged in you're plugged in and uh, i'm shaking you um yeah so uh oh i think i just did a boo-boo. Yep. <laughs> Tried crossing three with one. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So, he's like, that's why it's hitting you so hard. Is you weren't prepared. And I'm like, oh, this makes sense. So, Sandy is my boss. Um, She's the manager of the store that I work at. So, I called her. And I said, listen, you know me. I never ask for anything. And she's like, yep. I said, and everyone's telling me if I need something to just ask. And she's like, yep. I said, I need tomorrow off. She's like, okay. I said, I need me and my husband to be off tomorrow. I need one day to just cuddle with my, my family and not have to work about worry about this place. I said, it's been stressful the last couple of months at work. Now, she's not there because she's homeschooling her kid. So, she's not there. I said, Sandy, every day it's more than 30 deliveries. Cher is pulled away to the front. Things aren't getting done on time. And I just need a day where I don't have to think about work. If I send in John, I'm just going to be worrying that he's going to need me to come in. And she's like, stop, stop, stop. I will get someone. She's like, the reason I'm not saying something right away is because I have a dog appointment, a vet appointment. And if I didn't have that vet appointment, I would be like, don't worry about it. I'll come in and cover for you. But she goes, we will figure something out. She said um, she would call the district manager, which we're both friends with, um, let her know what's going on. And she said, just don't worry about it. I said, so no matter what, I don't have to worry about this. And she's like, no matter what. No, I think that was the second phone call that was said. Because she goes, so well, let me make some phone calls and I'll get back to you. Well, um, she, I can't, after the funeral home, I told John, I said, I just gotta, I gotta go home. I'm going home and I, I just need to, I'm going to take a nap because 
for the last, okay, I can't say the whole 28 hours, but most of my, of, of Tuesday, I was crying for an hour and a half straight, basically, I cried at the hospital, you know, I had this migraine that I just couldn't get rid of, and all I wanted to do was just go home, cuddle with Becca, and take a nap. Now, what I mean by cuddle with Becca, Becca, okay, I pulled too far. Um, we get back to back, and I concentrate on her breathing, and she basically puts me to sleep. So, um, when I woke up, which I felt really bad, but then I didn't feel bad because I woke up and I saw that I missed a phone call from John, um, two hours ago. I call him back. He's like, um, I'm in the kitchen. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I just picked up my phone, saw that I missed your phone call and I called and I met him in the kitchen and I'm like, what was going on? He's like, I had a time delivery and I was wondering if you could take it. I'm like, I am so sorry. He's like, he goes, I didn't want to call you, but I felt like I had to call you. And then when you didn't answer, cause I thought he was mad at me. He's like, I realized, what do I care? Your mom just died. He goes, I got it there on time anyways. Everything worked out. So, but I knew if, if we had to work Thursday, that would have been it. I would have been called in and yeah, I mean, I'm a strong person, but I'm not that strong. So after I talked to John, I text Sandy. I'm like, so what's going on? She's like, I don't know. I, I left it in Nicole's hands. I'm like, okay, Sandy. So, can I just stop worrying about this and it's going to be taken care of? And she's like, that's exactly what I want you to do. Don't worry about it. It's in Nicole's hand. She will have to find someone. So, they actually, they did find someone. Um, the only thing that kind of upset me, but then I was like, well, I guess not. I wanted the day off so I didn't have to think about work. And all day I was getting text messages from people at work giving their condolence. And it was like, oh, you can't be mad because they're giving their condolence. But then I started thinking about work and, oh, my God, did they get someone? Is things getting done? You know, but. Okay, so now we're on to Thursday. And oh, you're really going to be a pain in the butt, aren't you? Man, I don't know if you guys can see the knot. There is a knot. Um, so. Oh, that Wednesday night, too. John said to me, so we're not working tomorrow? I'm like, no. I told him, listen, I don't ask. I don't, I think I'm just going <sighs> to. I hate to leave that, but I guess I'm going to leave that. That not. Um, I don't have the patience to deal with it. And it's keeping it strong, tight, so. We're just going to not worry about it. I mean, I don't care about my back. There's little knots here and there that I can't get through. And I don't care. I don't care what my backs look like. How the way I finish them, it does not matter. Anyways, um, I'm like, yes, all I want to do is um, spend time together and just watch some TV shows and just have a relaxing day. I don't want to have to think. And he's like, I'm good with that. So we wake up. 
I told them too. I said, in the morning, I want us you to go run and get our favorite breakfast from this little um, restaurant down the street. We get a ham and cheese omelet. I said we can have breakfast together. And um, we can just watch our TV shows. The plan was to watch all the Chicago's. Chicago Fire, PD. I don't know what's wrong with Hulu. I don't know if it's because I have their TV service. But I used to get Chicago Fire and all those without commercials. And now I have commercials. And I'm very pissed off about it because I pay for non-commercials. And I have commercials. And I told John, I said, well, maybe it's because with Chicago PD and Fire and all those, you only get like four episodes and then they expire, and if you don't have the, this is, okay, so before I got the, um, their cable service, or whatever you want to call it, their live package, TV package, I think that's what it's actually called, um, the normal no ads Hulu subscription, um, you would only get, I think it's four, four Chicago Fires, and then they were gone, and they were gone. You would have to um, buy them off of iTunes or, oh my God, I don't even know, did iTunes even do that anymore? I always buy it off of Amazon Prime. Um, The episodes that you missed. Well, I don't know if because we have the live service that they don't get taken away. I don't know. But they have commercials. And I was like, okay, so I've grieved for my dad. I had I have dealt with grief before. But as I stated, I think because this happened so fast and we weren't prepared, it hit me harder and faster. So, um, how my grief manifested, I think is the word I'm looking for, is I was very, um, exhausted. Of course, couldn't stop crying, migraine, and I felt like my brain was not, how do I explain this? Working at the proper speed? It was like you would say something to me and I would have to take like one or two seconds to compute. It was like I had a delay. And then I would answer and I felt like I was answering very slowly. It was like everything was in slow motion is the only way I can describe it. Everything happened in slow motion. So I told John, I said, I can't do this. I can't. Because all I wanted to do was cross stitch and watch TV. But when I'm watching a TV show, I concentrate on that TV show. But if it's a commercial, when the commercials came on, I would just like zone out, you know. And then my brain would start thinking and, you know. I would just be like on a different planet, basically, is the best way I can describe it. So I told John, I said, I can't, I'm, I can't concentrate because then the show would come back on, but I would still be like in my head and it'd be like, oh shit, what did I miss? Because while the commercials were on, I was letting my brain just wander and if I was watching something where I didn't have commercials, well then I could just stay focus on the show. I hope this makes sense. So I'm like, let's go to Netflix because there's never not commercials on Netflix. So I started going through, you know, stuff that I wanted to watch. No, I didn't even get that far. Turned on Netflix and um, the first thing, you know, how they advertise things to you was this documentary about uh... I think it was called 
a Mormon, no, murder, murder among Mormons. I think that's what it was called. So it was a three episode docu documentary. And I said, what, well, how about the, how about this? Because another thing, when we were on quarantine, we watched a lot of murder documentaries or things about serial killers. Um, God, what was the one show we were watching? Um, it was basically different, different people, real stories about people killing people, like not serial killers, but oh, I can't think of what it was called. Um, true crime. It was like, oh, we watched a lot of true crime, real stories. I think like, oh, I just shook you guys again. Sorry. I had, um, a dog hair in my eye that I had to deal with. Uh, I think it's HDTV or eight. I don't know where they have all the, that criminal stuff. So, and Becca was in here with us too. I said, how does this sound? And they were both like, "It's it looks interesting. Because, you know, they, they show you like this trailer. So we watched that. And then we found another one to watch. And then we started watching this one where, um, which we thought was only three episodes. It was something about a staircase murder. And, um, now, by now, it's like, I want to say four o'clock and John's like, I need to go take a nap. I'm like, okay. I said, well, we'll just pause it right here. And then tomorrow we can, you know, finish it off. This is the last episode. This is episode number three. So he did that. He went to go take a nap and then me and Becca hang out and we watched, um, Married at first no no what were we watching did we start watching married at first sight oh my god I don't remember now I think that was no that would have been yeah we had to we were gonna start watching something and then we decided, no, we did. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Um, we started watching and didn't realize that it came out. The married at first sight must've been Wednesday night that we watched that when John went to bed. Yeah. That's what had to happen. Um, we started watching um, Georgia and Jenny, which we didn't realize that just came out last week. So we're like, oh my gosh, we have to wait a year for the new season to come out. But that was really good. So it was just great to have my rocks. Yeah, it was just good to not have to think about anything. Then went to work yesterday, which Becca went with me. And thank God. Um, there was, I think, close to 40 orders yesterday. It's just crazy. So I looked on the screen for today. I'm like, John, there's already 20 orders for tomorrow. I said, I'm going to have to work tomorrow. And so, got up this morning. Did I already say this? I might have. I don't know. Took a shower because there were 10 o'clock funerals, 9 o'clock funerals. John did the 9 o'clock, so I was going to come in and do the 10 o'clock. 
I get out of the shower and as I'm getting dressed, John texts me. He's like, oh, I might not need you until 10, 11 o'clock. I'll know more then. I'm like, couldn't you have said this 15 minutes ago? Which, oh my gosh, it's almost 11 o'clock, so it doesn't look like I have to go in. Thank God. But yeah, even yesterday was hard working. I just feel like I'm still in that slow mode, which I'm feeling better now. I think I was worried too about doing this because I didn't want to be crying so much on here, which I, I did good. I think I only cried twice. She's in a better place now. Um, her wishes were to be put in. I have two flower beds in the front yard, which you guys have seen. I'm putting her ashes in there. And because my dad's in there and she wanted to be with my dad and then my brother contacted me and he asked um, if I could put some ashes in a box and ship it. He's out in, I want to say Colorado, the first place that weed was ever legal. I want to say it's Colorado, right? He lives in a shack out in the middle of nowhere and harvests weed. That's what he does for his living. So, um, my mom was born in Arkansas, lived most of her life in, well, her younger life in Texas, moved to California, moved to Michigan. Moved back to Texas and then moved back to Michigan. So that's that's the places that she's all lived. And I guess my brother is close to California. I don't know. I'm bad with geography. Very, very bad with geography. I have no idea. Or maybe they're taking a trip to California, but... Um, he wants to go to all the places that they have discussed and spread her ashes in a couple of places. So I said, yep, we should get her ashes, I think, Monday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, just depends on the medical. No, the funeral home said they're having a hard time. Of getting doctors to sign the death certificate. That's what's been holding up a lot of funerals. And I'm like, that's just ridiculous if you ask me. But I told her there's no hurry. We're not doing any service. Um, it would just, the only people who would come would be me and my kids and husband. My aunt lives in Texas. My brother lives in, I want to say it's Colorado. I don't know. Um... There's no one else. There's, I have a cousin that she talked to, but I already talked to her and told her and she agrees. It wouldn't, you know, it's not something my mom would want anyway. So we basically had her memorial Thursday. And of course, when the ashes, I'll get some flowers and do a little service in the front yard, I guess, you know, when we spread our ashes. But what are you going to do? So that's how my week has gone. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. So I guess I'm just going to leave it off here. Um, I just want to thank Miss Coffee and Becca for being my rocks. Without them, I would not have made it through this. Um, that's for sure. It was, it was very comforting when I, I would ask, when I would talk to be listened to. That's basically 
it, you know. I talk, they'd listen. When I was quiet, they would talk, you know. Okay, I feel like I'm going to start having a meltdown, so I'm leaving it off here. I will see you guys. Um, oh, yeah, that's why there hasn't been a stitchy time and all that either. So, um, I was thinking today I'm going to talk to Becca, and I think we're going to film the stitchy times on Sunday. The only thing with that is on Sundays, I like to get up, take a shower, and I don't um, blow dry my hair, put hairspray in it. It's the one day that I don't, you know, put any products in my hair. I just wash it and let it dry naturally. And that means I, I had to put on clothes because Sunday's my pajama day. <laughs> so I keep rethinking this, but it makes sense to do it on Sunday. So Maybe Saturday is going to have to become my pajama day. Do nothing but cross stitch. So that's what I like to do Sunday. Sunday is laundry. Saturday I usually clean the house. Sunday is usually laundry. And just stitching. And napping. And relaxing. So... I might have to change that to Saturday and do my vacuuming and cleaning house on Sunday. That would make sense. So, I hope you guys um, have a great week. Thank you for listening. Um, yeah, I'm just going to end it here, guys. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.